Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to you in the pews and to you at home to worship with us at Unity United Church in Midland. And thank you to all who make this worship happen. Thank you to Berna for providing the music and preparing us the choir every week. Thank you for the choir members and thank you to the greeters and the liftoff parader and, and of course our tech people. Anybody I forgot? And this morning we pray for Shirley Wilson, a member at Unity who, who formerly was at Unity who has suffered a stroke and is in hospital in Whitby. And I'd like to convey to all of you that Jean Whitaker phones me quite often from Alberta, and she sent her greetings uh, to all of us for a happy new year. So we don't forget our former, well, they're always our friends, but our former uh, 
members of this church. And our birthdays this morning are Cindy Pearson on January 16th and John Webb on January 21st. Same birthday as my brother. <laughs> are there any other birthdays or celebrations? Oh, Phyllis's was yesterday. Had a, a wonderful little birthday supper with Phyllis and Joanne came. Joanne is, is uh, not very well, but uh, she uh, was so happy to celebrate um, with Phyllis's fam uh, with Phyllis, myself, and Brian, uh, the birthday. Clara. So let us, anybody else? Clara. Clara. Oh, Clara's birthday is tomorrow, and how old is Clara? Nine. Oh, my. <gasps> Nine. Let us sing happy birthday. Other announcements? Oh, Darlene? Volunteers, you are needed. Uh, many volunteers are doing all of the jobs, the varied jobs that we have here at uh, Unity and Volunteers make this church tick, as you know. So we're looking at the sign-up sheets for the interest groups. I've put them downstairs. Take a look, see what interests you, and uh, sign up where you can help. Challenge yourself. Try something you haven't tried before. Do something you haven't tried before. You might feel really creative and want to be on the decorating team. Or you may think you need to learn what Ross does back there. Oh. <laughs> and, <Here's a> <laughs> and, <laughs> and sign up for um, letting him have a break when he needs one. And if you feel like you need to um, get your exercise going, Carol Cooper will get you going with fitness. That's another option. So please sign up and check the list downstairs. And um, I guess I, I just have to say, many hands make light the work for all of us. So please sign up today or before next Sunday. That will give Charlotte and Barb time to put them in the annual report. Thanks. Thank you. And if you have an idea for an interest group, by all means, let Darlene know. The Christ candle is lit, reminding us that Christ is the light of the world. And we who have opened our hearts and lives to the light of Christ are commissioned to be the light of Christ to all we meet.
Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to see the sunshine? <laughs> Please read with me responsibly, responsibly the call to worship. Through the waters of baptism, God is the divine presence. Jesus was called through the waters of baptism. Through the waters of baptism, we too are called. By the sacrament of baptism, we are marked and claimed as God's own. Jesus was claimed as God's own, commissioned to do God's ministry and empowered by the Holy Spirit. For worship, remembering our baptism, as loved, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and commissioned as God's people. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism as we worship God. Let us pray. Creator God, who loves us with no end, even when we struggle to love ourselves, we listen for your voice from above, saying, You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. God of all grace, Christ alive in our hearts, spirit of all we love, open us to the wonderful possibilities of today and the new year ahead. Give us minds that wonder, hearts that seek, and lives that offer healing, so that wherever we go, we might live out the challenge to build a beloved community. Alleluia. Amen. Our story this morning has a powerful message for us, for all of us. When your heart is heavy and your step unsure, When the winds are wild and the path unclear, don't fear the night so dark and vast. Or the hazy future. Or the stormy past. Know that I am here as steady as stone. We are stronger together than we are alone. Hope and light will always prevail. For love wins. No matter how old, no matter what you wear, no matter the color of your skin, love wins. And wow, when you think of everyone in the world, Love wins. Wow. Love wins. Love will never fail. All around the world.
our community ministry focuses on transformational justice by affirming the worth of individuals, empowering communities, and seeking social justice. We've been offering support in the community for over 60 years as an organization and have grown from one program that started in the basement of United Church to now having over 30 different programs. Poverty is not being in partnership or not being in communion with the other. And when I asked one of our indigenous brothers and what it meant to be poor. They meant being poor meant a lack of kinship. Any transformational spiritual moment or a moment of grace, you can't predict when that happens. It could be because it was your 30th bowl of soup for breakfast, or it could be because uh, you got your income stable, and um, it could be that you had a place to sleep while you were working but not earning enough to find an apartment and you had a safe place to keep your things while you were at work until you could find a new apartment. And that's one of the reasons why um, we have such a broad spectrum of programs that we offer, because there's no one magical thing or moment or program that works for everybody. Being a sober parent is a big a step for me. Like, I've been sober before, but not this long to be an apparent. When I use my tools from talking to people that understand and that can give me good, honest advice back, and it's usually here at work, outreach, the minister, my boss, um, people up in the admin. It just gives me that strength that it's okay, I'm not alone. My experience here has been uh, a positive one. I've been coming here for 11 years. Um, I mostly come for the meal program. They've helped me with mental health issues, finding suitable housing. Uh, it's been nothing but a positive experience. By giving back to the community sometime, you know, they give back to us also. It's all about lots of love. The love here, honestly, it's crazy. It's really crazy. When you come here, the door is open. I like it because it's friendly. Well, I was a single parent and had my son home alone. I was on a fixed income. I needed somewhere to take him where he could interact with other children. It um, helps the uh, people who actually need help. For me, it was just a sense of community. It was just nice. We do drumming and pray together and read the gospel and offer smudging and traditional medicines to everyone in the room. We do community ministry because Jesus told us, feed my sheep, take care of my people. Your gifts to the mission and service of the United Church of Canada help make programs like these possible. Thank you, and please continue to give.
May the Holy Spirit speak to us through scripture. The first scripture reading is from the ancient book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Throughout the, this first reading, um, Israel is called the Lord's servant and the chosen one, destined for a nonviolent mission of mercy. Here is my servant who I, I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk on it. I am God. I have called you to live in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you safe. I have given you as a covenant to the people and provided you to be a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, freeing those who sit in darkness. I am God, this is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former predictions have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The second scripture is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, answered him Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my God, my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Herein is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let us think about the sacrament of baptism for a few minutes. A sacrament is a universal Christian act that is a visible symbol of God and channel, channeled for God's grace. The sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of Holy Communion are our two sacraments. I did a paper on baptismal fonts while at Emmanuel, and since then, whenever I traveled and visited churches, I looked for the baptismal font and discovered how beautiful many were. Some were very prominent at the entrance of the church, made out of stone and very beautiful. And one church in Germany where Martin Luther preached this church is built over a running stream. And there is a hole in the floor at the front of the church where people kneel for baptism with the flowing water. And when I went on a tour of the Holy Land, there were a couple of women on the trip whose sole purpose for the trip was to be baptized in the River Jordan. And it was a beautiful ceremony. Singing and the rest of us were sitting on the platform singing hymns as several were fully immersed in a pool beside the Jordan River. Now we're told that we need only be baptized once in our lives, but many people feel the need to renew their baptism, and so the rest of us knelt over the edge for the minister to renew our baptism. 
I brought back a bottle of water from the Jordan River to mix with local water for baptisms in my church. And then when I went to St. Anthony, Newfoundland, I brought back some water that is claimed to be 10,000 years old because divers go and chip off pieces of icebergs. And if you ever go on a ship out of St. John's, you see the guys diving um, over to an iceberg and um, chip off some ice, and so then you can have 10,000-year-old ice cubes in your drinks. <laughs> Water is universal, and the sacrament of baptism is a universal act. Baptism is a huge symbol. As all life begins when the Spirit of God swept over the waters of the earth. And life begins in the water in the womb. And when we're baptized, we are born anew to life in the ever-moving, ever-changing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Baptism usually happens in the water blessed and poured from the baptismal font on an infant's head, followed by a mark of the cross in oil. And it is there that we witness the hope for the newborn's life to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And later, when the child enters the most difficult transformation of his or her life, the teenage years, we bless the child again through confirmation. And then some feel called to deepen their ministry by becoming ordained into a life of ministry by the symbolic act of laying on of hands. But whether we follow the exact order of events or not, we as a community of faith all share, live, and commit to our own personal and broader ministry of the church throughout our lives. God's transformative Holy Spirit is always at work and not to be taken lightly. What we need to acknowledge is that there is a living power that is at work in each one of us, the power of God in the Holy Spirit, which is the same living power of the Spirit of God that works in the lives of all creation that shapes the reign of God on earth and sustains all things by God's grace. Let's think for a moment about power and who owns the real power. In these days of lust for power over others determined by the amount of money in their bank accounts, or by the power of the bombs they have built and are ready for war, we are often excited by this power, but often crushed and disgusted by its abuse. We all have the power to contribute to the good of everyone and to the planet. And yet some people seem to think that power is their birthright with no influence from the one and only higher power. Remember that the apprehensive disciples asked Jesus when he told them that he was returning to his father, well, what about us? What will become of us when you are gone? You can't leave us. And Jesus answered, predicting the day of Pentecost, I will send the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power to be my witnesses. Jesus' power to save the world from self-destruction would continue through the faith and ministry of a living church. We must continue to believe and promote that truth. Our New Testament lesson for this morning is Matthew's account of Jesus' baptism. It is actually a public affirmation of who Jesus is, one like no other human being who was filled 
with a supernatural and very potent power. When Jesus was baptized by his cousin John, the skies opened, and a voice was heard saying that he was God's son, set apart as divine and empowered, so that he could fulfill God's plan for the world. And when John pulled Jesus dripping wet out of the Jordan River, one gospel, called the Gospel of the Ebionites, wrote that at that moment, a great light shone through the heavens, and the voice of God thundered, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am delighted. Jesus' baptism, then, is a baptism of public power, publicly witnessed and experienced by the community of supporters. Every time we baptize, every time we commission and ordain within our United Church of Canada, we count on the community of supporters. The laying on of hands on the beloved child or candidate for ordination becomes the hands of God, passing on the power of the Holy Spirit to use their gifts to become God's visible presence on earth and a blessing to others. First and foremost, Christian power is servant power, power that is fully and emphatically embraced so that it can be fully and emphatically given away. Isaiah's words were written when Israel was still in exile, without land, without influence, without hope. It would have made sense for Isaiah to pump up the people with images and encouragements of a superpower future, a vision of military and political strength when the enemies of Israel would be crushed and destroyed. Instead, the image of power that the prophet presents is an image of faithful service, the gracious and life-affirming power of justice, liberation, and freedom given away to others. God said to Israel as well as to each one of us, you are my servant. I chose you. I will be with you. I will put my spirit upon you. And when you embody my power through servanthood, then you will become my beloved. Those were the words of the ancient prophet Isaiah and are still relevant, uh, relevant to us today, which is over 2,800 years ago. Christian power is not only servant power, but gentle power. Isaiah writes that God's empowered servant does not cry or lift up his voice, nor break a bruised reed, or quench a dimly burning wick. And many of us know that sometimes our wick is dimly burning. The servant uses strength and authority not to control the other, but to gently heal and release the power of life around him or her. Christian power is the transforming power of both the strong and powerful and the weak and broken ones. Jesus lifted up the paralyzed to walk, healed those with leprosy, made the blind to see, and the dead to awaken by the power of the Holy Spirit invested in him. And many times, Christian power transformed those who are very wealthy and powerful, but who have transformed and begin to see themselves as servants to those less fortunate. Jesus' embodied power of the Holy Spirit is a persistent power, a power that never grows faint and could not be crushed, that even the power of death on a cross could not extinguish. It is a transformational power that never dies, 
and continues to inspire and nurture heavenly life after death. John's cousin, Jesus, John's cousin, Jesus, was transformed that day when he baptized him, the Son of God. And that day was the day that John realized what his purpose was, which was to prepare the way and to proclaim the good news of the promised one. The disciples whom Jesus chose to be his disciples were also slowly transformed and understood their important role as disciples. And to this day, we who believe are constantly being transformed when we take the time to pray and listen to the voice speaking to us from deep within. The stories of the Bible are powerful, inspirational stories that have held the meaning of life for over 2,800 years and probably longer. They are stories that come alive by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, and they hold meaning for each one of us. Thanks be to God. now receive the offering.
of grace and God of glory, what offering can we bring that is worthy? What praise from our lips befits your glory? When we share our gifts and talents to help another, when we pray daily, alone and with others, when we live in community of friends, when we acknowledge the beauty around us, and when we notice the miracles of new life around us, when we welcome your presence in our lives, may your love transform us into your beloved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, during this past hour, may we have felt the movement of the Spirit in this place and within each one of us through the music and words of Holy Scripture. May we face this new week renewed and inspired to live life abundantly, to look at others lovingly, and to laugh often. God of love, in whose presence we find what it is to be beloved, we thank you for the expressions of love that we have witnessed in our own lives, amongst our family and friends, our neighbors and colleagues. And may we always remember to love people for who they are, as your beloved, as Jesus loved, and to forgive people as we have been forgiven and to welcome all people into our church, our homes, and our lives. We pray for all who are suffering from abuse, poverty, neglect, illness, or from the loss of someone dear. And we name out loud those names who are on our hearts for whatever reason. We pray for Shirley Wilson, who suffered a stroke. We pray for Joanne Granger, who is recovering from pneumonia. We pray for Ray Carrier, also suffering from pneumonia. We pray for Judy Millen in hospital, in hospice. And we pray for Johnny and Margaret Guchik. We pray for the war in Ukraine to end and for the injustices to end relivable income and health care. And we pray for the growing number of deaths from drug overdoses to end. In the silence, please hear our prayers. God of love, you know what's on our hearts before we even say them. Hear these are prayers, and in your love answer, as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
us leave this time of worship remembering the delight of baptism, the strength of community, and the call to live as one of God's beloved. And may the light of God, the love of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit go with you wherever you go. Amen. Thank you.